Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. We're in Romans chapter 6. What I'd like to do to start this session is just get us right into the verse where we left off last time. Romans chapter 6 and verse 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. And any time anyone yields themselves to be a servant to someone else, and we talked about this last time, there has to be a compelling reason. There has to be a necessary reason for obeying someone else, for putting yourself under that. And, and, and in this, he says, as you have yielded your members' servants to, and he mentions two things there, uncleanness and iniquity unto iniquity, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. He says, even so now, yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. For those who are saved and have already trusted Jesus to be their Savior, we were faced with a gospel message that showed us how to be saved, and we obeyed that message. And that's exactly what we did. And even though we are saved by grace through faith without works, our flesh, and you know this from the last time we talked, that infirmity of your flesh mentioned in that verse is the natural tendency of your flesh to want to get a hold of some external performance system and try to please God by obeying the law or some form of the law, even a Christianized version of the law. And I know that we talked about this last time. Well, you know what? When you take the law away from us, it's almost like what do we have now? What is it that motivates us to stop sinning and to do good? What is that? And, and and, and that is where we're going to get. But our flesh has that natural inclination to do that. It loves performance. It wants to utilize the law to justify itself. And it wants to utilize the law to sanctify itself. Well, you know what you found out? Your works can't save you. So you had to abandon the law to get justified. You had to, by faith, trust Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. Now you're going to find the same lesson again in sanctification. That even though the flesh wants to try to use the law to produce good works and please God, you're going to find out it's going to be something different. And here's the danger. That natural desire of the, law, of the, of the flesh to utilize the law, if you add that, let's just do this. The natural desire of the flesh, and then do you add to that the misunderstanding of the law? Well, that thing is running out of ink fast. And you add that misunderstanding of the law, and that doesn't look any better, does it? You're going to get something. There's a, there's a sum that's here. Your flesh gravitates toward the law. And when you misunderstand what the law was about. Does anybody remember what the law did? God gave Israel the law to do something. What was it? Yeah, to put them under the dominion of sin. That's what he said in the scripture. See, and we have the idea, oh, God gave the law to keep us from sinning. No, he gave the law to show you how bad you are. That's what that was. So the misunderstanding, when you add those together, here's what you have. The death of your functional life. That's what that produces. That's exactly what the adversary wants to produce. That's exactly the plan. Now, you know better. You have already seen the scriptures and you understand the law is not what is given to you to keep you from sinning and motivate you to do good. Grace is given to you to do that, but we haven't yet seen the aspect of grace. Although, we've already read it. We've already read it. 
But the reason it didn't jump off the page to us is because we needed to understand something about the words we were reading. And once you see those, then you'll begin to understand how grace is the greatest power in the world, in the universe, in all creation. Grace is the greatest power available to motivate you to stop sinning and to do that which is good. And so I want to show you that thing today because that's what your father wants you to see. Now, there's some things that you need to know about this, and that is because he says this, I speak after the manner of men. What are you saying? The thing that is true, of, generally true of all men, about that infirmity of your flesh, because all men deal with the flesh. So that means everybody has to deal with that natural desire of the flesh to go get a hold of the law to please God. He says, I'm going to talk to you about that. God is anticipating the wrong way in which we're going to try to live our sanctified life. Look at me, Linda. <laughs> Sorry, that's a joke. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she knows what that's about. Uh, so what he does is he gives us that corrective doctrine in ver starting in verse 14 and running through the end of the chapter, in verse 23, he gives us that corrective doctrine because he knows the wrong way to do this is, is going to be coming. So if we take away the law as the way to live our sanctified life, what do we have to look at? Well, the answer is grace. Grace is going to give us all the motivation that we need. And it's by grace that we're actually going to produce a certain kind of fruit that your Heavenly Father means for you to bring forth. And I'll show you how that operates by grace. Because you may be thinking in your mind, how in the world does that happen by grace? I've got to have somebody tell me. I've got to have the law. But you don't. You have something much better, and that's what we're driving at. Now, where we left off last time, I mean, we did get to verse 19, but I left you off in this verse, 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Now, if we look at verse 17, when you were unsaved, you were the servant of sin. Yes? Okay. It says, but you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. What is that form of doctrine? What is he referring to when he says you obeyed from the heart, that form of doctrine which was delivered you? What was that form of doctrine that got delivered to them? Okay, but what was that? We, we would, huh, the gospel, right? It was the gospel message. In all three parts, and we went over those. Do you remember what they are? We're all under God's wrath. There is no excuse or exception. And Christ died as our substitute redeemer. And when you found that, you obey. Someone could say, ah, see it is a work. They obeyed. But notice what the obeyed is called here. You obeyed how? Yeah, that's right. Because what did you do when you heard that message? You believed. And believe, belief is a non-meritorious work. It, there is no, no work, no deeds involved in belief. You either believe or you don't. But that doesn't change anything. It doesn't impact anything. And so you obeyed from the heart. You believed that message. And because you did, then of course, God's offer of salvation from the debt and penalty of your sin was by grace through faith without works of any kind. Now, verse 18. Being then made free from sin... You became the servants of righteousness. Now, verse 17, if you go back, look what it says. That ye were the servants of sin. Now look in verse 18. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Do you, now, now, you know what your father is doing here? He's telling you how he sees you now. Before... You were a servant of sin. And he says, and now that you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you are free from sin. You've been set free from that. Now you are a servant of what? And that's how he sees you. By the way, is that a done deal? That's a done deal. Look how he says it. 
ye became. You became that. And he needs you to see that because he's counting on you understanding that in order for you to understand what grace is going to do in your Christian life. So when he says, you became the servants of righteousness, he's stating a fact about what happened in your new identity in Christ that you wouldn't know about unless he told you about it. So now he's telling you, you're no longer a servant of sin, now you're a servant of righteousness. And he says, and when I look at you, that's who I have made you to be. Now I just want you to have that in your mind, that that's what, he needs you to see yourself the way he sees you. Now, verse 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as you have yielded your members service to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, hey, which servant were you when you did that? Servant to sin. Even so now... Based on the fact of what he just told you, that you're, you're now free from sin, now, you ha- now you've become a servant of righteousness. So he says, even so now, yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. What is he saying? Do that which is in accordance with who I have made you to be. Do you see? I made you now to be a servant of righteousness. So... Start living like it. That's all it is. That's all, right. He's just saying, you used to be one way and you live that way. I've made you another way. Live this way. And you're going to have the power to do that. Everything that needed to have been done. We're not going to go back and rehearse it. But in order to do that, you need to be made dead to sin. Did he do that? Sure. That's why I told you in verse 2. You need to be made alive unto God. Did he do that? Sure, he needed to crucify your old man. Did he do that? Yeah, Yeah, verse 6. Everything that needed to be done, he did so he could make you a servant of righteousness so then he could turn around and say to you, start living like who you are. Understand who you are. It's like someone coming in the door and scooping up Ruby and say, you're the new queen of England. You never knew you were in that line, but you're the new queen of England. And you're going to have to come back over and take the throne. And you know what they would, and Ruby would go, well, I don't know. And they would say, start, you know what they would say? Start acting like the queen. Of course, Wanda told me that's no problem. Ruby's always acting like the queen. But, you know, that's what you would say. Act like who you are. Act like who you are. That's what your father's saying. Act like who I've made you to be. So. One other thing to notice about this before we move on, and that is, notice in verse 18, you became servants of righteousness. That's the done deal, right? A servant of righteousness. But when you get to verse 19, he says, now yield your members servants to righteousness. Why the prepositional difference? Yeah, because this is the thing that's already done. This is the thing you are now to do in light of that. See, yeah, that's right. Put that thing into practice. So I, I did this, you are a servant of righteousness. That, my son did all that on the cross and it became yours the moment you trusted Jesus to be your savior now that you are done it now, now that you've done now that you're done it I'm sorry now that you're done it I don't know where that come from now that you have been made a servant of righteousness he is saying yield your members as servants to righteousness now that's the part you're going to do that's just going to be the natural outflow of who you've been made to be okay So, instead of utilizing the law, which is the infirmity of your flesh, to keep us from sinning, by the way, that little phrase, yielded your members, service and cleanness, and to iniquity unto iniquity. That's in the context of that infirmity of your flesh. The natural desire to try to get the law. Do you know what that means? That if you try to, if you try to live your sanctified life according to the law, it leads to iniquity unto iniquity. It just goes further and further. You work yourself into a deeper and deeper hole. 
He's showing you what the end of that is there. That you're not go that's not going to get you. The law has no power to make you stop sinning. Now, that yield your members is in line with verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield your members, servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, rather of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Notice the part I've highlighted. To whom ye yield yourselves, his servants ye are. That's the crux of the verse. And then he gives you, and he says, rather it's sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And you know what that means? You have a choice about who you can yield yourself to. God is not going to put your arm behind your back and put you face down into the dirt and make you make the right choice. He has made everything possible for you to make that right choice. You are a servant of righteousness. Jesus did that for you. It became a reality when you trusted him. But even though you have been made a servant of righteousness, you still have a choice about who you will yield yourself to. Just because you're made to be a servant of righteousness doesn't mean you'll automatically yield yourself that way. That is something you're going to do. And it's made possible for you to do that. And verse 19 is asking you to do that. Now, one other thing, and then we're going to go back to that verse. And I think I'm going to take you back to 19. But I want you to notice here, he says, You can yield yourself to sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. That was 16. Let me jump you now, I think, back to 19. Now we're going to get a further issue of righteousness. This is now getting very close to what is it about grace that motivates me to stop sinning and do that which is right? What is it? Because in verse 16, the only thing you knew is, I could have obedience unto righteousness. But now he's telling you, yield your members as servants to righteousness unto holiness. And when you read those two words... What should happen in our minds is we should be going, Wow! I see that! But I know what you're thinking. See what? <laughs> and the reason that we say that is because we need an understanding of what that unto holiness is about. Because most people think righteousness and holiness are synonyms. We kind of think they're the same thing. But he's used both words in the same sentence. And he says, you're going to yield your members as servants to righteousness unto holiness. So they're two different things. And in order for you to get that, you're going to have to see what that holiness issue is about. Now, let me see, because I know I'm going to jump you ahead if I'm not careful right here. In verse 16, yes, servants of righteousness. Now in 19, you yield your members as servants to, right, to righteousness unto holiness. That righteousness is now unto something. And that explains the big question everybody wants to ask. And here it is. Well, if a lost person does good stuff, what about that? Can't a lost person volunteer their time at a, you know, a soup kitchen? And can't a lost person uh, help their neighbor? Can't a lost person give sacrificially of their means or of their time for someone else without getting anything in return? Can't they do that? Of course they can. Of course they can. And seeing people want to say, well, what about that? What makes that, what, what disqualifies that? Why can't God look at that and say, that counts for righteousness? Well, I want to answer that question. And, and that'll be the last thing we'll get to do in this session. But what I want you to understand is, any righteousness that a lost man does 
cannot save him. Because God said there's only one way for that to happen, and that's for you to have perfection. And if you miss that, you're in big trouble. And the thing is, we didn't like come really close. <laughs> we, we really blew it. The other point I want to make about that is, any righteousness that a lost man does, when a guy is lost, let's do this. We'll just use the terminology that we normally use, lost and saved. Although, you know, in Romans 1 through 5, I try to get you out of that a little bit because that's not the terminology that Paul used. He used justified, remember? But when you talk about that, a lost man's identity is in who? Okay, well... It's in Adam. Remember, that's the one man concept. A saved man, justified man's identity is in who? Okay? It's in Christ. If a guy is in Adam, remember the components? He's under sin. Remember that? And this guy, his sins are... Okay, he's forgiven. This guy is considered... This is what the Bible calls him unrighteous. What did this guy get? Okay, he got God's perfect righteousness, right? Okay, well, look, without just going through that whole deal, you've got enough of it now for me to do this. When this guy does any kind of good thing, he is doing it out of his position in Adam, which is under sin and unrighteous and is an enemy of God. When this guy does something that's right, he does it from a position in Christ in which he is forgiven of his sins, he's been imputed with righteousness, and he, he has the atonement. You remember that? The reason God can look at this guy and say, I reject what he does, is because it is done from a position in Adam as an enemy of God. This guy is doing it from a position of being in Christ who is made at one with God. See? It's a whole, it's coming from a whole different place. And when God sees this one, he goes, I really like that. When he sees this one, he goes, I have no, that means nothing to me. That's nothing. You say, but it's the same act. It's not about the act. It's about where the act is coming from. And, and, and no matter how many good things this guy does, what did we learn over and over and over and over and over in, first, in, in Romans 1 through 5? That, that no works are not allowed. If God's going to judge you by your works, where are you going? You're going to the lake of fire. Okay, now, just trying to dwell on that except to say there is this idea that, well, you know, if we're just going to talk about being a servant of righteousness, what about the righteous things that a lost guy does? First of all, they're not righteous because they come from the condemned position of being an Adam. The only reason that you can do it as a saved person and it's righteous isn't because of you, it's because of what? It's because in him, you've been given his righteousness and you were made a servant of righteousness. He did all that for you. You were made a servant of righteousness. So when you do it now, God can look at that and say, I like that. Amen. I, I still feel like maybe we haven't done that whole issue, but I at least wanted to say that much. Because God is not just looking for righteous acts that can be produced by anybody, including a servant of sin. He's not just looking for righteous acts. God is not just looking for good deeds. But he is looking for a particular kind of righteousness. This guy, you say, I don't care what you say, when he did this, that was righteousness. But now in verse 19 you found out God wasn't just looking for righteousness. He was looking for righteousness that was unto holy. 
holiness. And a lost man can never produce that. Because that has to do with your sanctification. And you can't have unto holiness, which is your sanctification, until you've received Jesus as your Savior. Otherwise, you're like Israel, and you think you can produce your own sanctification by keeping the law. And you can't do that any more than you can produce your own justification. That makes sense? Okay. I don't... I don't know where we are. I don't have the light on yet. So I think I can go just a little further. That, oh, let me say this about verse 19. That unto holiness at the end of that verse, that is the necessary reason. And again, I know, you say, I just don't see how that is the reason. How does unto holiness change that thing about the issue of righteousness? And so what I want to do is I want to talk to you about this issue of holiness. This, this is the thing that we have to understand something about. Now, when Paul says this, even so now yield your members service to righteousness unto holiness, is he defining holiness for you? Is he explaining holiness? He said, well, I don't know. In verse 20, does he? I mean, no, he doesn't. In fact, for the rest of the chapter, he doesn't. So if he doesn't define it, and he doesn't explain, and this is, by the way, the first time the word holiness has shown up in the book of Romans. So if he doesn't explain it or define it, what do you automatically know? Yes, you should already know something about holiness. And what he is going to refer to here. And I want to talk to you about the difference between righteousness and holiness. Because when you see this. When you see this, and we come back and read that verse with those last two words attached to it, you're going to see that then and go, I get it. I see it. That's my motivation. You would like to get there, right? Okay. Not sure. What have I got left, Randy? I'm at what? 27. That's how far in I am? Really? Okay. Well, then we have, we're doing good. Most Christians think, and let's put this up. Most Christians think that righteousness and holiness are the same. Now, I mentioned that to you just a while ago. But when you think about holiness, you have to ask yourself, what does holiness mean to God? Now, if I were to ask you about holiness, what would you say right off the top of your head? Okay, one says separated unto God. And holiness absolutely carries that concept. Separated unto God. And that's not wrong, but there's something more that he wants you to see in the general that's, and that's a good, that's a good definition. If I, 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 in fact, anybody want to add to that? And maybe you can, we'll put this whole thing together. Perfection, we do think of that with regard to holiness. Pure, that's true. All of these things that we're talking about, including that separated unto God. If you're separating something unto something, you're also separating it from something else, right? And if you're talking about something pure, like Karen said, it's pure as opposed to what? Something that's not pure, right? And you said, Linda, you said perfection. But when you say perfection, it's contrasted over against what? Okay. Something that's not perfect. When we see holiness, we often define it as being that which is different from all of those bad things that we think about. Impurity, imperfection, sin, corruption, you know, impurity, all of that. We see that. But we're going to have to define holiness differently. And the reason that I tell you that is because 
God was holy before sin ever entered the picture. So we can't define holiness just as, as it's contrasted with that which is unholy because he was holy before there ever was an unholy. So what is holiness in its most... And we are, in this verse, talking about righteousness and holiness in their most general term. None of those definitions are wrong. They're all aspects of holiness. But what we're after here is a very general understanding of what righteousness and holiness... And you say, well, Mike, how do you know you're after the general definition of righteousness? Because he's not mentioning any specific righteous act. He's just talking about righteousness in, in general. Righteous, yield your members service to righteousness. Did he tell you how to do that? Did he tell you what that would be? He didn't, did he? Did he detail it? Did he give us a list? So all he's after here is to say, to understand, here's what righteousness is, here's what holiness is, and when you get those definitions, you read that back in, you'll go, wow. Okay, I'm trying to get you to the wow. But I want you to get, I need, I need us to, to make all the steps so you understand, I don't just make it up and jump us over there, but we actually see how the scripture is taking us there. In in our, in our justification, folks, we were made the righteousness of God in Christ. We got that imputed righteousness. In our sanctification, we are made the holiness of God in Christ. And in our exaltation, we are going to be made the glory of God in Christ. And all three of those make up your entire identity in Christ. We haven't seen anything yet about our exaltation. He hasn't spoken to us at all yet about us being the glory of God in Christ. He is going to get over there eventually, but he hasn't gotten there yet in the book of Romans because he started you out with, right, with justification and now you're into sanctification and you're going to be in that for a while. But he is eventually going to talk about your exaltation. And by the way, the policy of evil has something directed at all three of those to corrupt this message that you are justified by grace through faith without works of any kind. There's a, po there's a, a, a directed attempt by the policy of evil to corrupt that. There's a message about sanctification to say that you are not sanctified by grace and you got it automatically when you receive Jesus as your Savior, but it's going to tell you you're going to produce your sanctification by obeying the law or some form of it. And there's another false message for your exaltation. And you're going to see the policy of evil attack all three of those areas because that is the total of who you are in Christ. And that, by the way, is how you're going to live from now all the way through eternity. And it's not going to change. And it's not going to go away. Now, so since Paul is not explaining it, and he's not... So we're going to have to go back and get something. And I think we'll be able to do this for the end of the session. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 6. Because what I want you to see is that holy... This is part of what you would have already known about holiness when you read it there in Romans 6, 19. Isaiah 6, 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Now, I just want to set this for you because we're jumping off over into Isaiah. But what Isaiah is caused to see is taking place in the throne room of the third heaven. And I want you to know that when you get into the throne room of the third heaven, you are looking at a place where a particular aspect of God's character is being demonstrated to everyone, and that is his holiness. This is what you're going to see, and this is what Isaiah is going to see. And when he says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, 
There's majesty associated with this. There's grandeur in this. And then it says, and his train. You know what the train is. You know, I have this thing in my mind when a bride comes down the aisle and she has this long gown that flows behind her. That's the train that follows her. And the Lord's robe, his train, literally fills the temple. I just want you to see this thing spread out in its majesty and in its glory. And he's sitting on this throne and Isaiah sees him. And in verse 2 it says, Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And that twain is with two. You know that. So there's the six wings of the seraphim. And then look at verse 3. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That single characteristic of God, of his holiness, is being extolled in front of... And Isaiah sees it and he hears it. Doesn't he? Yes. Verse 4, And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Now, I don't want to take the time to talk about what that smoke is about, although that's, a, that's an important piece of information that tells you something that's happening up there in the throne room at that particular time. But I do want you to know that as Isaiah sees this and he realizes the Lord is on his throne, he's high and lifted up, his train fills the temple. This is majesty. This is the creator of the universe. I'm standing in the presence of the creator. And his holiness is being declared by the seraphim. What's the first thing that enters Isaiah's mind? He so recognizes how holy God is, it occurs to him how unholy he is. Look at the very next verse. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the, peop in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah is struck. That's why I said, when people, when they see, people say, well, when I see God, I'm going to tell him. When you see him, you're going to realize what a worm you are. Now, that's, there is no going to be... All you'll have to do is see him. There is, ma there is unbelievable majesty in that. I'm dying right here to tell you about something that he's going to do for you and your glorified body out there in the creature. That when people see that, they're going to immediately recognize something about that body too. But I will refrain. Because I know you're wanting me to. <laughs> but look, when he sees this and he realizes I'm unclean and the people I dwell in the midst of are unclean, he gets this, I see God in his holiness. Don't you see what I see here in that if you want to find the perfect opposite to holiness, he calls it unclean. Right? But aren't we right back to doing what we did a while ago, and that is defining holiness as the opposite of something else? Perfection. And perfection is a part of that holiness. But that doesn't give us the general definition of holiness. That just tells us again what it isn't, more or less. By the way, if God calls something unclean, what do you, this is a clue, by the way, about the general definition of holiness. If God calls something unclean, what do you know about it? It's dirty. It's dirty. Okay, it's not washed in the blood. Well, uh, let me ask the question a different way, because you're giving me the answers that are right. I just didn't ask the question right. What is it God himself thinks about it with relation to him? He does not want it around. If it's unclean. Remember when a leper, he had, to, he had to publicly proclaim out loud what word? 
unclean, and what they do? They put him out of the camp until he was considered clean. When the priest performed a certain function, he was considered unclean, and he would wash himself and wash his clothes, and he would be unclean until the evening. All through the law, we find all the stuff about unclean and clean and all this kind of business, and a priest had to do certain things before he went in to make the sacrifice, or God would kill him. And God is looking at this issue of holiness and uncleanness. Now, this is where our roller coaster has finally gotten to the top of the track. Because what we're about to do now is take off down for the rest of this. The rest of what I have to say today is now just going to go straight downhill from here because now we have all the setup that we need. Because this, this thing about holiness and them crying holy, they are talking about the very essence of who God is. And God has surrounded him in that place with that which is holy. Things that he wants around him. And Isaiah understands that's not what he is. And there's something that happens to him right after this. One important for what we're looking at today. But what I want you to have in your mind as we go into the break and come back is that uncleanness is the very opposite of holiness. And when God sanctifies something, sanctification and holiness come from the same word. That's why in the, in the part of the book of Romans that talks about your sanctification, it should come as no surprise that he is talking about righteousness unto holiness. Because the, that there is, are these, I mean, do, are they, has, does righteousness and holiness have a relation to each other? Yes, but they're not synonyms. They're different. Does justification and sanctification have a relationship to each other? Yes, but they're two different things. One of them is about your eternal life with him. The other one is about how you live your daily life. But they are connected, but they're not the same thing. And so what he's going to do now is he's going to talk about this holiness issue. And, and, and when we come back from the break, I want, to, I want to give you one other reference in the Old Testament on holiness. And then we're going to bring this back to Romans six nineteen, And I'm going to show you two things that's absolutely going to astound you. Those two, and, that, and I've saved them for last because they're like, Dessert. You're supposed to eat dessert first.